Hey, how y'all doing? Everybody had enough coffee? Everybody uh, had uh, uh, not enough rakia last night? I, I had a lot of rakia last night, but I, I think I can still entertain today. So I'm Tim, and it is my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Martin Kulaf. Thank you, Telerik. I love this conference. This is like the fifth or sixth time I've been to Sofia, and I love this town. Um, I'm old. I have gray hair. I'm always the one standing next to the big guy. Uh, but today I get, to, I get to speak to you instead of having a uh, CEO breathe down my neck because my demos are screwed up. I run, that was supposed to be funny by the way. Um, I run two companies, actually I don't run them, I, I'm the figurehead of two companies. I have brilliant people that work for me, so I'm honored to do that. One's a custom software company and you, you've seen many of the keynote demos and stuff that we build, that's Internology. The other one's just a, a product company. Like Telerik, uh, we build kiosk and interactive software. Enough about the about Tim stuff, um, the uncomfortable about Tim stuff. So I thought I'd do this keynote, and I've been doing a bunch of keynotes for the last few years. I thought in, in this case I'd give you a little bit of my history. And, and the theme is going to be, I do have gray hair. I've been doing this a long, long time. So. Uh, when I got to college, to university, I had not seen a computer before. That's how old I am. We didn't have programming in high school. We didn't have computers. We had Latin. That's supposed to be funny too. Am I not funny today? Um, I've never been to anything but Catholic schools. Out of, out of university, I joined EDS. Does anybody even know who EDS is anymore? When, when Ross Perot ran the company believe it or not. So I thought, here's what I started on. I, I took programming in, in college and I loved it. I became addicted to it. Pascal, if, if you know that language. In fact, the irony there is, you know, I'm literally married because of semicolons in Pascal. Now, R Richard and, and Carl are in here somewhere and they know my wife who is here with me. Uh, I worked in the computer lab. She came in, had a syntax error. I added a semicolon. She said, I'm going to marry you because it compiled, right? <laughs> and then isn't it ironic that C sharp comes out and, and they require semicolons. I feel so much love by that. Anyways, does, does anybody know what this is other than Richard? Because Richard knows everything, right? Does anybody know what this is? Anyone? Yeah, I heard it. I heard it. Go ahead, shout out. I'd, I'd love it. That's uh, JCL. This is what I did for a year. This, I allocated resources like memory to the godlike COBOL programmers that, that got to write COBOL. And I wrote this crap. Does anybody know what this does? The, the one guy out there who knew this was JCL? Anyone? It does that. Now, for those of you who are under 30 years old, this is a DOS prompt. This is, this is how we used to use Windows, right? Um, that's all that does. After a year, I got to do this. And you probably know what this is. This is COBOL, right? Anybody remember Level 77? When they introduced Level 77 to COBOL? Other than Richard, does anyone know what Level 77 does? It's um, allocating dynamic memory, like um, in, in IIS, in a classic ASP, what was, that, uh, what was that memory variable that you, session, remember session variable in, I in the first version of ASP, you carried memory around um, it, it for the life of your app and it, it caused your, your CPU to die. And anyways, this was a big deal for COBOL and it's not resonating with you guys, so I'm just gonna move on to Pascal. This is where I really found, um, fell in love with programming uh, because I, I used a PC for the first time. I got to use at IBM an IBM XT. Does anybody remember this? I can't see your faces because of the lights. Uh, an IBM XT, it was in 19, oh, let's see, 1985, it was $10,000. It had a 10 megabyte hard drive, 10 megabyte hard drive. And it was the, the most awesome thing in the world. This is when I fell in love with PCs. So 
I'm old, right? Have I, have I not said it enough yet? The, I am, look at, look at that in the top right. That's my actual Microsoft certified professional number. Seriously. <laughs> I, in fact, I'll get to it in a minute, but um, I once wrote the, a third of the certification questions for one of the tests, and I failed the test. All right? Um, so this is back when this is back when when Bill, you know, Microsoft was one building, and Bill Gates, as we're taking this test on the first, the very first version of SQL Server, which Microsoft didn't even build, it was the Sybase product. And Bill Gates, as we're taking this test, me and you know, 50 people, our uh, Bill Gates would look in every you know 15 minutes to see how everybody was doing. Um, I thought that was kind of kind of cool. Uh, so I. Um, uh, you know, because I went to university in the 80s, there was no such thing as object-oriented programming. You know, it, it's funny how we, we've gone in this transition from non-object-oriented programming to object-oriented programming, and now they're not teaching object-oriented programming in university, at least in the U.S. anymore. We're, we're kind of um, transitioning out of that, but. I learned it from Fox Pro, if you, if you can believe that. And I started going to conferences back in these days um, and meeting people like Paul Sheriff and Beth Massey and these people who are now my friends now. But everything was, uh, all the work, you know, if you wanted to work in, in software, everything was in Visual Basic uh, 2.0, 3.0 in, the, in this time frame. And the reason I love Visual Basic is I lied my way through a job interview saying that I knew how to do it and I didn't, but I could learn it and you could learn it so quickly. It was so productive as opposed to like native code. Um, Win 16 I go back to and things like that. And this is when, and, and I'm glad Carl is in the room. I know he's here somewhere. There he is right there. Um, this is when Carl started this, this site with his, with his partner at the time, and we could go on the internet and learn. I mean, this was the beginning of community. Carl Franklin really revolutionized the way we learn programming by sites like this. And we owe Carl a lot for, for, for that. Thank you, Carl. I honestly didn't know Carl was gonna be in the room. I love doing this slide because this is how I learned VB. So in VB, the reason VB was great as opposed to Win16 programming, C++, is you were so productive. Does anyone know what the um, Windows GUI spec is? I'll just tell you, it's in 19, God, early 90s, Microsoft produced a document called the Windows GUI spec, and it defined how a Windows application looked and behaved. It defined you know, that the top right is the little red X and that's quit, and that file is always the menu on the left, and exit is always the last choice in the file menu, stuff like that. It defined how an OK button looked, what its size was, what its typeface and font were, things like that. Well, in VB, you could drag and drop your way to, to, and get all this stuff for free, and it was so productive. And you could break all the rules of the Windows GUI spec by making green backgrounds and giant buttons, and pink buttons, all right? So I'll, I'll get, there's some context, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, I, let's see, in the late 90s, I worked on a product team at Microsoft, um, when Microsoft was late to the internet. Uh, re you remember this time, and Bill Gates put the mandate out that uh, we will, dominate in the internet space. So I worked on the first internet server product for Microsoft. Its code name was Olympus. This is arguably the worst server product Microsoft ever produced. And I was, you know, a, a dev lead on an architecture team on this one. Anyone know what this is? Other than Richard, who knows everything? Uh, this would be Microsoft Site Server. It's, it was supposed to compete with Lotus Domino. If, if you can remember back these days. This is where I learned how Microsoft built software, though. This is how, the, really, how it launched my career. And uh, I have oh, thousands of friends still at Microsoft. 
um, that I really respect and love. Um, and I was so proud back then. Look at that handsome mustache. No, none of you, none of my friends ever told me how stupid I looked with a, with a mustache. Um, and, and that's back when Bill Gates was so engaged in, in this. I, I really miss, and I think Microsoft misses, um, Bill Gates' in, engagement at the company. K2. Richard, do you know what K2 is? No one's going to know what K2 is. That, that would be IIS... 3.0, NT Option Pack, which had IIS 3.0, I worked on that product. In fact, I once produced a bug that put 2,500 people out of work for 12 hours. Yes, that was called, thank you, thank you very little. Yeah, I bombed the IIS stack with a mistake and um, my boss was not pleased. Anyways, this is supposed to be a joke. This is not a bestseller. I don't think anybody ever read this book. Um, but I started writing books, and I'll never do it again um, because it's a royal pain in the butt. Windows DNA, can remember back to these, God, what a dumb book that was. Um, but th here's the one I'm, I'm most embarrassed about. Uh, this, this book, I was the lead author on, uh, and I worked on this product team at Microsoft, and uh, it was a tremendous amount of work. See that middle guy in there? Anybody recognize that guy? I'm in the top left. That's, that's Hanselman. I, I met a 22-year-old Scott Hanselman back in these days, and I was so impressed, I said, hey, do you want to write in this book for me? And he said, uh, oh, I don't think I can. Um, and look at him now. Holy cow. Yeah, God bless Scott for this is the first thing, his first published work. Right. And he is embarrassed. Absolutely. He is absolutely embarrassed that I am showing this book and him about it. All right. So I founded these companies. I thought you'd be curious because I'm so far from home um, on where I live and where the company is. Uh, I'm from San Diego. Well, like most San Diegans, I'm from Los Angeles, California. We live in Carlsbad, California. Um, we've had plenty of Bulgarians stay at the house, I can tell you that. Uh, let's see. So back to pro productivity. I'm all about developer productivity. Um, my companies for the last... Whew, when did we get... When did we get XAML? Like five years ago? For the last many years have been doing XAML type stuff. And, and in WPF and Silverlight, we get tremendous pro productivity too. We can drag controls on, on a form. We can use Telerik controls and drag them on a form. Very, almost identical to what we did in Visual Basic, but now it requires a huge machine. That's supposed to be funny. That, that wasn't really that funny. Uh, the, the only difference is what you couldn't do in VB3 or VB6 is you can't, with WPF and Silverlight, you can do this type of thing, right? <laughs> Everything has to have a gratuitous animation, animation. All right, enough about me. Let's do a demo, huh? Uh, clearly, if you know me, I'm much more comfortable in Visual Studio or, or um, demoing software than I am in PowerPoint. Um, Pay, pay specific attention to the heart. I'm going to use the heart as a theme throughout this presentation. And you may or may have not noticed this thing right here. I'm going to do a crazy ass demo. Oops, I'm, not, I'm being recorded and I said a bad word, excuse me. Uh, I'm going to do a crazy demo at the end with this thing right here. And I'll probably totally screw it up and you guys will laugh. All right, my fingers are on the screen. I am rotating. And I am zooming. This is .NET. Can you believe that? And, and this app was built like two, three years ago. This is in production at a variety of places um, in the United States. It might be international too. Anyways, .NET doesn't steer scalpels and do heart surgeries. It, it does documentation essentially. Um, so I am drawing what, what the surgeons typically do is they'll run in the room and they'll draw an artery or something like that the way it appeared or and here's the or or the way it, it was in the actual patient and they'll in this world they put stents I'll put a stent or a lesion 
And in this world, you either prop up an artery or you tear it down. One's a stent, one's a lesion. I always get them mixed up. But they're essentially documenting a heart procedure. Here are the actual magnetic resonant images of what was done to the patient. But typically, you know, surgeons are not partying on the outside of the heart. They are partying on the inside of the heart, right? So I can just as easily... I can just as easily, and if I knew what the hell I was looking at, I could zoom into an artery or an aorta or something like that. Um, do you not think that is cool? That, that is amazing. It's just .net. Um, and you know, what, you know why it's so cool? That control, that 3D control, was built in two weeks. Two weeks, not by me, by some brilliant kid that works for me. Um, but the, the productivity we get in .NET is, is just so amazing. Uh, and and you, you may be saying, oh man, that's cool, I want it. You are more than welcome to have this 3D code. In fact, you could go to CodePlex and grab it. Search on my name or Internology or The Heart or something like that. We put it up on CodePlex. So if you want to spin your own 3D, amen, go for it. All right, moving right along. And I only have an hour, so I need to go kind of quickly. I hope you don't mind. Oh, yeah, I was going to show you this thing. Um, remember, we're on a heart theme. Does, does anybody know? I'm sure you do. This is the world. Let me just tell you. This is the world's, the United States' most stupid television show. <laughs> All right? I, I personally have never seen it end to end, and, and we build software for it. Um, my wife loves this show, though. If there are any males in this room that have seen this show, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> All right, so let me show you, let me show you this. There's this Dr. McDreamy guy and Dr. McSteamy guy. And I, all right, are we ready for sound here? Here we go. I'll resect both atria and build new ones out of bovine pericardium. And during reconstruction, Dr. Hunt will stay with Linda using a human donor aorta to prepare the vessels for reimplantation. And all of this in just four hours. We have to be fast. We all set? Let's go. All right, prepper and page me when she's ready. Christina, are you excited? Yes, absolutely. Good. Good. Here's the love interest. Notice in the back. The fear of going back in is worse than actually doing it. Just getting back on the horse is all it is. You keep an eye on Carrie. All right, enough, 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 enough. I'll reset. Okay, you, you thought I was, we were going to watch the whole episode, didn't you? No, don't clap for that. I'm ashamed of that. Don't clap for that. No, but that is cool technology, right? Uh, I should probably tell you something interesting about that. It took 17 takes to do that two-minute scene. And the reason it took that time, the handsome doctor guy, I don't, he leaned into, uh, what's, what's the actress's name? Christina O? Oh? Sandra O. Oh. He leaned in and his elbow touched the Microsoft Surface, and it would reorient the heart, and he did it 16 times in a row. Uh -uh. True story. Very nice people, by the way. You hear uh, you know, terrible things about actors in Hollywood, but th these are very nice people. Um, all right, here's what I started with. This is one of the computers I started with. We have come a long way in hardware, haven't we? Um, there's nothing new about touch devices. We've had them since the 50s. I put the, you know, I, I changed this slide and put the Microsoft Surface 2. I, I was really hoping to have one with me for this. In fact, for the last 14 months, every month I get a new email from Microsoft saying your brand new Surface 2s that you bought in October of 2010 will be delivered next month. 
14 straight months in a row. Um, but that device will come out and hit. It has plenty of competition, doesn't it? Uh, but it is a brilliant device. And of course, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of Windows 8 today. Uh, I know other speakers are doing it, so we won't go in any, in any detail in this keynote. But I have a session later on today that uh, I will go into some detail. Um, so what's new is commodity, the commoditization of hardware. Uh, in other words, these things are getting cheap. These things are getting really um, inexpensive. Um, and, and I'm not talking about $800 couch computers from Apple. I'm talking about PCs that, that actually are at a price point that uh, many people can afford. You are going to get, I was just talking to Richard about this, you are going to get multi-touch in your computing devices, whether they be from Apple or Dell or HP or whoever, whether you like it or not. Um, it's just become so inexpensive that they're, they're going to be in mobile devices and, and that type of capability will be for everyone. Anybody recognize this date? Richard, I bet you don't even recognize this date. This, I have been preaching multi-touch and the natural user interface, interface, NUI. I have been preaching this for over five years. But it wasn't until this date that anyone really believed me that we are going to be using computing devices. This date was this. The best thing that ever happened to multi-touch and NUI. Um, as, as painful as it is for me to, to put uh, Steve Jobs up here, and, and um, I, have, I have had the pleasure to sit in a few meetings with Steve over, over the many years ago, and, and God bless him, and I hope he's doing well in heaven. But, uh, um, it, you know, I've been working for or with Microsoft for over 20 years. Um, and it's painful that Apple actually revolutionized touch computing, but it's helped us. It's helped us on the Microsoft side. All right. I, I thought you'd find this interesting. I hope you find this interesting. I'm, uh, this is not God's gift to computers by any stretch. You know, this, this is essentially, well, I just shocked myself with it. This is essentially a two-year-old computer, and it's essentially worthless now. Uh, you, you probably couldn't even buy this for 200 bucks. Yet, look at what a great job it did with uh, WPF and 3D and things like that. Um, these computers are going to be commoditized. Here's how it rates in Windows, if you're familiar with the Windows GUI spec. I, I'll tell you something else interesting. I was joking in the speaker room yesterday. Um, do you know why? that Windows Experience Index rating is, it's like 1 to 8.2 or 7.5 or something like that. Do you know why it's not to 10 or why it's not to 5? It's because in Windows Vista, the algorithm that calculates that, uh, there was a bug when you installed Windows Vista on that Macintosh G4 thing. That, that Apple computer, that G4, was such a beautiful machine that it broke the algorithm and they had to fix it in a service pack. That is why, can you believe they screwed that up? That is why uh, it's on a rating of 1 to 8.2 or something like that. All right, so what else do I want to show you? Oh, I wanted to show you this. Uh, I wanted to show you, I don't want to show you that. I want to show you, da, 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 how about this? Now, I could show you this in Firefox just as easily as I could do it in IE. But remember, we were talking about WPF earlier and how you could do real 3D, not perspective 3D, real 3D. Um, and you could do the multi-touch thing. Uh, this is Silverlight. Silverlight um, does not have a beautiful implementation of multi-touch. Uh, it does not at all. WPF absolutely does. Um, this is a control we built to overcome Silverlight's weaknesses, and you're welcome to it. Um, and in fact, anything I show you today, you're welcome to, short of uh, the Grey's Anatomy stuff, which I'm technically not supposed to show because of copyright. But uh, I can build this app. I won't do it here. I'll probably do it this afternoon. I can build this app in five minutes. Why? Because the geniuses that work for me built a control that has all the trigonometry and all the calculus and all the stuff that, that, that 
allows us to implement multi-touch in a browser. Uh, and the Silverlight API for multi-touch is basically, I know something's been touched, I just don't know what and where. So with companies like Telerik and, and controls like this, remember I'm all about developer productivity, we can build apps like this. In Blend, I can build this app in five minutes without typing code. Drag the control on, click, 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 set some properties, boom, I'm done. That is very powerful. That's powerful for us programmer types um, that get so much productivity out of .NET and soon to be Windows RT. So, the other thing that's relatively new in this world, and, and so I'm trying to go in through the past, the present, and the future, and what's relatively new is the combination of I interacting with software with physical objects. And, and we're building a lot of software that where you have a physical presence. What do I mean? Let me show you a little video just because it's impossible for me to demo this without a Microsoft Surface. And that would be here. Are you ready for sound? Hi, this is Tim from Internology, and I'm here with Dan Hannon. Hi there. Hey, Dan. So, um, this is pretty amazing. This is Craps. You built Craps for the Microsoft Surface in the the R&D time that um, Internology gives you, playtime I call it, it's called recess. Recess, research and educational coding to enhance software skills. <laughs> Fantastic. Beautiful. So in your recess, in your R&D time, you have actually built craps. Um, so this is a fully functional craps game um, with the rules and the betting and everything. So the first thing you do is you come up and you have your chips and you try to place bets. The UI is alerting you to the fact that you need to kind of establish your spot at around the around the table. So I'm gonna the green guy is gonna play right here. Because we'll, this is a multi-user game. Is, Technically, yep. I could be the red guy. We're gonna play together. Okay. So red chips over there, green chips over here. Before we roll, we have to place some bets. Most typical bet in craps is to play the pass line. So you just tap your chips down on. Well, I won't do a most yeah, typical exactly. bet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna play the pass line. I'm gonna play. Uh, a couple of hard ways over here. Okay, and I'll do 30. Go. All right, so then to roll, the dice down here indicate that it's my roll. I'm green, so I'm going to flick the dice over here. We have fully 3D, uh, WPF 3D dice up here as we roll to keep your eye on those dice. They're semi-translucent. You can see through the, the top face down into the bottom. That was kind of fun to implement that. Oh, yeah, I didn't even notice that. 3D. But it's got a little drop shadow on it, yeah. so pure, true 3D here because we do have WPF. Yeah. And then, so what happened there is in craps, I'll kind of explain as we go, but uh, I, I rolled a nine, I mean a, a nine, yep, so I established the point as a nine. The field bets, I, uh, you bet that I would roll a nine, so you just won 25 bucks. You can flick that off with your finger if you want to cash out. Just there it goes. Now you got a little Sweet. extra in your bank. Everything else stays, and we roll again. A couple more things about what we did. We did a, an interesting gesture implementation here. So if I have my bet out here, let's just go bet up here on the eight. And as I place it down, hopefully you can see that, but there's a, a set of arrows on each side that let me, we call it the ratchet gesture. And so you can see my bet right next to it. Oh, I'm ratcheting fantastic. up or down, $100, $200, $500. So let's let it ride high, 500 bucks on eight. I can do the same thing anywhere else, ratchet it up, 200 bucks. I got a lot of cash to spend, so go ahead and spend some up there. Yeah, I want There you go, 1,000. I want a party. Maximum 2,000 bet. You're draining your pocket. Let's give it a whirl here. So. You are getting to the acrylic dice. Yes. My favorite part of this app. I just added this in the last week. We got these cool acrylic dice. They're see-through. Um, we got these from Microsoft. And you can't even tell on the camera, but they actually have a bite tag on each of the six faces. But what's really cool about it is the bite tag sticker is transparent, but they've got it set so the IR sensitivity, the infrared sensitivity on these tags is correct such that the cameras can recognize them. So instead of flicking with my finger, I'm gonna roll these physical dice out here. And it's going to recognize the role, represent it here, just sort of for informational purposes, and go ahead and play the game like normal. That is awesome. Is that sweet? That is 
<laughs> so awesome. It really uh, um, makes you speculate about the way user interfaces are going to be done. And, you know, beyond keyboard and touching, really using Definitely. common objects. And Physical you, objects. You yeah. can't even see. I mean, even holding this up to my face, I can barely see the object tag in there. That right. is very cool. So you might, that's a little subtle thing that I did in the rules. Where, so he picked up that dice, he put the other one down, and we're not counting that dice be, yet in the roll because I haven't, I haven't re-rolled it, right? So that's the first roll of the second pair of die, right? So now if I pick this one up, roll it. Now that's a legitimate roll. Outstanding. Pick those up. Roll. There goes all the activity. Flick your bets off. I'm up a couple thousand. How you doing? I'm getting my butt kicked. All right. Just like usual. Hey, Dan. That's right. This is awesome. This is absolutely awesome. Thanks so much for showing this. Yep. Glad to do it. Is that not cool? Yeah. I mean, I, I still get... I still get tingles when I watch that because uh, I, I, you know, I do a lot of predicting, and I, most of the time I'm wrong. You know, I predicted the death of the internet in, in the mid '80s because, you know, I came from beautiful binary protocols. You know, with TCP/IP is just awful, <laughs> and and but little did I know that Cisco would make a bad thing worse by inventing that 8550 router, and and now we're stuck with it. But. Uh, I make a lot of predictions, uh, and I really believe that we are going to see a ton of physical interaction with software, um, whether it be in, in retail scenarios or airports or things like that. I think our mobile phones, we're going to point them or touch them into to computers, and, and things are just going to happen. In fact, I'll tell you a little story that I'm not supposed to tell you, but since I'm in Bulgaria, I will. Um, Hilton Hotel, which I'm staying at here in Sofia, uh, right next door, we built a wedding planner uh, surface application for Hilton. And you, you, go, you meet with the, the bride and groom and then the parents. In, in America, I, I don't know if it's the case here, but in America, the bride's dad has to pay for everything. Is that the same here? All right, well, it's very expensive, right? So they get the, the bride's dad and the, the happy couple together and then the, the Hilton people, and you drag out the bride and you put it on the surface and you drag out the groom, and then you, you lay out the table, it integrates all the guest list, and you put the mean grandma in the back, and, 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 you know, and then you drag out the, the bars and the food and all this, all physical stuff, and it just starts adding up. You know, 10,000, 15,000, 20, and, the, and the, you know, the bride is like, yeah, we want two bars, and we want a, ba a live band, and, and, and the, the, the poor dad just watches the tally, right? And, and it produces a piece of paper, $50,000, and, and he's done, right? You, you can't say no at this point, because the, the, the happy couple's all, all bought into this deal. Um, the other thing we've learned very quickly and this is obvious, I'm not teaching you anything here, but we've, we've learned that learning is facilitated much better, especially in older generations like mine, um, when, when there's a game involved or when there's activity involved. So I wanted to show you very quickly um, something we built for NASA. Um, in recent years, and you know, you absolutely know um, how the United States is doing financially, not well. In recent years, um, NASA has had to defend its budget. And we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars, right? One of the ways they defend their budget is with things like this. This application runs in anything NASA related, like the Smithsonian Institute and museums and things like that. The, the job here the, the, is that you learn about what it takes to launch a rover for Mars. And, and this is fully multi-touch capable. I can, I can put my, my fingers on the screen and I, I won't go through this whole thing because it takes about an hour. Uh, unless you're one of the engineers that built it, they can, they can click, 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 and ultimately get to the countdown, you know, 10, 9, and the, the rocket blasts off. But it's telling us here, through a game, that the first thing we need to do is a payload shroud. I, I have test data here. 
you know, because a lot of it's copy protected. But this little movie, like the one prior, is saying a uh, uh, payload trout is a blah blah blah, and and you need it because of this. And, and in the real game, you'd have options of like ten payload trouts, and you'd pick one. And the trick here is that you have a money budget, you have a weight budget, and you have a power budget. I just spent $10 million by using that payload shroud. There are $20 million ones, things like that. And, and the trick for NASA, very complicated trick, is packing enough power and enough science where you can really make it a meaningful mission. And, and this app has been shockingly successful in teaching. It was designed for fifth graders, but it is, it is uh, affected older generations my, like me, and um, and uh, done a great job in getting NASA the resources uh, that it needs. So ultimately, ultimately, after you, you know, here I'll drag a rocket for you. You know, a rocket, that's the video that says a rocket is this and that. So now I have a bunch of choices. Um, so n now I just spent $75 million, and it's warning me that, you know, I'm not to go overweight. Ultimately, you, you get to science. And in science, there's 10 gazillion things. When this application is done and you've actually launched the rocket, it comes back and says, okay, because you put all this science on the rocket, you know, here's what we've learned about Mars and what we're doing in space. This thing runs in WPF, it runs in Silverlight, it runs everywhere, and uh, it's really been an interesting learning tool. Okay, moving right along. Cool, thank you, yes. Those NASA people are um, pretty darn interesting. Anybody seen this before? <laughs> I, that, that's a joke. Because uh, we're, we're now in Windows 8 hysteria and we'll be in Windows 8 hysteria for the next year or so until it ships. I, am, uh, I was bought into Metro uh, when, when this first came out. I, I am, you know, by, by, by trade I'm a software engineer. Uh, but for the last four or five years, I'm just fascinated with user experience. I, I've never formally been trained in it. I'm just fascinated in it. And I bought into Metro when Joe Belfiore essentially invented it four or five years ago. Um, I, I think, who would have thought that Microsoft would win awards for design? Did you know that Microsoft has actually won an award for design in Metro? That seems so weird. You know, Apple wins war awards for design. So let's take a little peek at this computer. Let's take a little peek at Windows 8, if I can figure out how to make it go. This is... Um, this is nothing. This is something. I'm doing that with my mind. <laughs> well, we're going to get to that. Hopefully we'll get to that at the end because um, as, as he panics here, um, I'm not panicked. Um, I believe in touching software. That's part of NUI, natural user interface. You're going to see me go like this in front of the Connect. Before I'm done here, I believe that we will use software with our hands, just with gesture, and, and that'll be commonplace pretty soon. Ultimately, though, and we're, we're just at the cusp of this, we're going to think it software. And, and believe it or not, there, are, there is some science that has made this um, happen pretty nicely. All right, did we get this going here? This is, this is Windows. Um, anybody know what those animals are? I promise you, none of you know what that animal is. If you do, I'll get you something awesome from Telerik. Even Richard doesn't know what that animal is. That is a rainbow trout. You, you have trout in your mountains here. Um, one of the brilliant things, not invented by Microsoft, but it, it certainly implemented here in Windows 8, is gesture-based authentication. Not biometric, you know, and it's not getting my, my uh, fingerprint or looking at my eye scan, but I have done the, I have um, configured this so if I circle the trout's eye, and then I circle the mayfly, and then I tap him on the nose, I'm authenticated. <laughs> now, you, I don't know if you noticed, but it also said, hey, 
you know, if you just want to type your password, click here, right? So um, I think that's brilliant. This is the Metro interface. Oh, by the way, this is not that cool tablet, cool, awesome tablet that they gave out at the Build conference a couple months ago. This is actually, I stole this from the dev team. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Can you go to the camera thing? It's really not that big a deal if you, do, if you can't go to the camera thing. Okay. Trust me, this is from the dev team. It has a Microsoft asset tag on it. This was actually one of the computers that they use for test and still do at Microsoft. Uh, so I'm, this is the Metro interface. This, this actual box and this build of Windows 8 is so old that it doesn't have, uh, what do we call it, um, semantic zoom. Semantic zoom, just brilliant. Notice how many apps I have installed. You know, there's a ton, right? That, that's not good usability. There, there's too much to, to functionally, if I'm looking for something, there's too much, right? In semantic zoom, you pinch gesture, and, and it doesn't have it, but you pinch gesture, everything gets smaller so that you can navigate brilliantly and easily. Uh, I, I, that's why Microsoft has won awards in design on this. What else can I show you here and not take too much time because I'm short on time? Uh, here's the one thing, when, when I was first updated on Windows 8 and how they're gonna change everything in the user interface, they talked about desktop mode. Desktop mode is essentially legacy mode. That, that's where we're gonna run .NET. Um, and, and I hate to say it, but let's, let's call a spade a spade here. I don't know if you know that term, but the reality is the .NET is gonna be legacy in just a few years. And everything new is gonna be Windows RT, uh, Windows WinRT. What we were terribly afraid of is that this desktop mode was gonna require like a control shift windows D and your screen would flicker to get back and forth. But notice the, the transition there. That, that is brilliantly done. This is essentially Windows 7 running in Windows 8, right? And to get back into Metro, I, I just do this type of thing. That, that, that makes the design of this really quite brilliant. Uh, let me show you this. We, we've at, at my companies, we've been building Metro software for a while. Uh, here is, believe it or not, this is, this is WPF. If you could switch back to native, this will look a lot better. Um, I think you all recognize this poisonous food um, because I know you have one right, right down the street. Um, in fact, let me show you, where is it? Where is it? Well, here, I'll show you. Th this is Metro, but this is WPF. You know, I've got the pinch gesture thing. Notice how it's seamless and, and, uh, and the fidelity of touch on this cheap little $200 tablet is fantastic. Uh, oh, yeah, this is it. You know, we, we, do, we do a lot of software for the cancer industry. Unfortunately, most of the software we build, I can't, I can't show you. It's protected by NDA, by you know, Pfizer and Merck. But we also are building the software that's killing people. And, and this is the piece of food that is killing people. This has like 3,500 calories. It truly is poisonous. Two deep fried pieces of chicken with bacon and cheese in the middle. Please don't eat this stuff. I shouldn't, you know, that's gonna come back to bite me. I just know it. Um, this company, Yum Brands, they have Taco Bell, Pizza Hut. I think you have those here too. Notice, I, I'm pretty proud of this. This is just the kiosk software from, from uh, um, the product company I'm, I'm involved in. Notice that, you know, WPF and Silverlight are vector-based graphics. You can do all that cool 3D stuff, right? But this is web content integrated, and I believe we use the Telerik control to do this, web content integrated in WPF, and it really is quite seamless. Okay, enough of Windows 8. If we could switch back over here, because I need to get a little bit rolling. How am I doing? Yeah, okay. Uh, this is the crazy demo. Anybody heard of this thing? Yes, yes. If it, if it wasn't for this darn thing, my 16-year-old would be a brilliant scholar. 
Unfortunately, this is the, the balance of his life. Um, the wide, wildest, the, the most successful, most widely sold electronic device ever, ever. Uh, this, when this thing releases a game, it moves the Microsoft financials. And we're talking about top five most profitable companies in the world, this thing. Uh, but we always wanted to, you know, for the last many years, we always wanted to build software for it. So uh, I'll do a little demo here. Um, I think I'll do a little demo here. Everyone cross your fingers because I can really screw this demo up. And that would be this. Now remember the heart. Please work, please work, please work, please work. Oh, thank God. All right, here we go. Oh, God. <laughs> see, see my third hand? There's my fourth hand. All right, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me try this again. All right. Now I have eight hands. Trust me, in, a, in, a, in the right environment without this light and things like that, you can actually get a pretty good fidelity. We build a lot of Kinect software now. Um, God darn it, I knew I'd screw this up. I, can, I promise you, I can rotate that heart. <laughs> and I can zoom it with my hands. I promise you I can. Damn it. Nine hands, 14 hands. It, someone's waving behind me. It's got to be. All uh, right, you're going to have to trust me. I, I, I'll do other Connect demos in my session um, later this afternoon. Yeah, you, you, you guys, you know, tell the, the professional demoer how to demo. All right. <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, hey, hey. See, I told you it worked. All right, whoever said turn it around and taught the professional demo or how to demo, I'll get you something from Telerik. Thank you. All right, enough of that. Um, there's a good news, bad news thing here, and that is um, here. The good news is. The Connect team came out with an SDK for .NET, and it, it's 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 not it's hard. It's difficult. Um, building gestures, my engineers tell me, is very very difficult. Remember, I'm involved in kiosk software, right? And if you're in an airport, the last thing you want to do, well, the Sofia Airport is beautiful and clean and nice, but my airport is LAX. Los Angeles. It's the most disgusting airport in the world. And the last thing you want to do is touch anything in LAX, right? <laughs> but, but if you want to see your flight, you absolutely want to do this. If you want to see information about, about your flight, right? That you, so you can see a world where this gesture-based thing is going to work. We are already building production software illegally for Connect. And the way we do it is in the contract for these companies, and I won't name them, um, they, they take all the liability. If Microsoft comes back and says, you know, we're suing you because you put a Connect app in production, they take all the liability. Uh, and, and I know here in Bulgaria this is particularly painful. The reason there is not a commercial license for Connect is the, the NAFTA thing. My, Microsoft has to negotiate with every country. So Windows Phone 7, Xbox, all that stuff that takes so long to get to Bulgaria, it's a, it's a governmental problem, not a technology problem. It's not Microsoft's issue. It's just like an Xbox. They have to negotiate individually with each country. So we don't have a commercial license to be able to do this yet. But we will, soon, I promise. Uh, I talk to that Connect team almost every day. Uh, so I showed you that. All right, you thought I was crazy. How am I doing? Oh, perfect. I'm doing great on time. Um, you thought I was crazy when I told you about this. We are eventually going to think at software. Uh, the first time I saw this was a year ago, a couple years ago, at, um, what's the name of that conference? It's not a Microsoft conference. I forget that, what was that, Carl? 
Yeah, Ted. They dragged some guy out on stage. You know, like I would, dra I, I can't wait to do this demo live. They dragged someone out on stage, put the headset on him, you know, did a little training thing. It took, end to end, it took about 15 minutes. And I can only do five minute demos here, right? So, and he literally was manipulating software by thinking at it. Brilliant, awesome. We're, we're gonna get there, and, and quicker than you think. And if you don't believe me, uh, let me show you a little video. Eventually, I'll be able to demo this on stage, but the training, you know, the, the, where you, you configure the software to, that, it, that it's, way, the, you know, your brain's wavelengths are all synced up, takes too long. So let me show you this little video. Future gamers won't need a joystick or a paddle. They'll interact with their games directly from their brains using devices like the Epic headset from Emotive. Our whole interaction with the virtual world is going to be far more natural. We'll be able to use our brain um, and our facial expressions and our emotional experiences to really experience content in an entirely new way. And what we've created is a brain-computer interface that really transforms the way that humans interact with machines. The Emotive Epic wireless headset has 16 independent sensors that pick up electrical brain signals on the surface of the scalp. We identify um, a signature for a particular thought or a particular emotion, and then in real time, we classify those brain patterns. So when you think it, it happens on the screen. You think push, the object propels forward. And then my master showing me how to pull using that tree, and then he'll ask me to focus all my thoughts on pulling that tree towards me. There are 13 individual detections, push, pull, lift, drop, left, right, and then rotation in six different axes in a 3D environment. You can even visualize an object disappearing, and it will. But the headset is more than just a brain-powered joystick. It allows the game to detect whether or not you're actually having fun. It observes your experiences, excitement versus calmness, immersion, tension, frustration, engagement. There are these mischievous spirit wisps that instead of pressing a button, I can scare away just by looking fierce. So, And you can notice by the sky color that I enjoy that part. So when it comes to future game playing, keep an open mind. We're really only at the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's possible. So will all this innovation in virtual reality gaming spell the end of a good old-fashioned night out at the movies? Future gamers won't need amazing? a joystick or... Very cool, huh? Um, yeah, you may be thinking, you know, what, what the heck is a use case for thinking at software? Um, but non-conscious type software, imagine a world, and this is so Apple to do this, this is not Microsoft, but imagine a world where as you're listening to music and the, the, the software is reading your thoughts, whether you like the music or not, and creating a database, essentially, of the patterns of music that you like, right? With that, that, that would be like a non-conscious use case for uh, mind manip manipulation of software. If someone were to invent that, they would make a fortune. This thing is only 300 bucks. And the, great, the really good news is it's, it ha already has an API for .NET and comes with a bunch of sample apps. I started talking about this in keynotes about a year ago, and people from my audiences are building the most amazing things. Trust me when I tell you that Microsoft Research has a ton of these things. You know, it's only a matter of time before we are going to think at software. That is very, very powerful. All right, this, let me wrap this up for you so I can get you off um, to sessions. Uh, this is not Microsoft's definition of NUI. This, this is just little old me. I think the natural, user, the natural user interface is three basic components. It's multi-touch, not single touch, it's multi-touch manipulation uh, by physically touching devices. It's gesture capable and we are just at the cusp of that. I think over the next year, we're, we're going to see a ton of gesture-based software. Since the device, this thing, is 150 at retail, and it has competition, 
Trust me, there are plenty of 3D cameras out there. That's all this is, essentially. A 3D camera with um, a multi-spectrum audio microphone. Oh, by the way, you know, I was going like this, but I could just as easily say, zoom, rotate left. You know, and, and it'll pick, in fact, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but we, re we have built the Big Brother software for this. We, we can look at you and pick you out individually. If, if you're looking at the kiosk, right, we, we can tell whether you've been there before. We can tell what race you are. We can, with an algorithm, we can generally tell how old you are. That's what advertisers want. Um, I think that's an infringement on my personal freedom, but, but we have built that software. So I, I think gesture, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm very proud of the cancer research stuff we do. I really am. I really am. Um, everything else, oh goodness, it keeps the lights on. Uh, and then ultimately, the third component, I believe, of NUI is going to be neural-based interfaces where we think at software. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, so we need Carl Franklin to build something like this. This is what I want. I want to walk into the holodeck and I want to meet that beautiful woman, actually. God, I hope my wife's not in the audience. Uh, and I want to manipulate a, like they do on Star Trek. We're not far off from this, and people like Carl are going to be the ones that are going to build this software within a few short years. All right, so if I've done my job effectively, I've kind of got, got you reinvigorated about building software and the future of how we're going to manipulate things. It's, it's more than staring, code, staring at code, right? It's the way our users use software. So with that, I'm going to let you go. And I appreciate you guys having me, having me here. If you want any of this stuff, feel free to contact me. And thank you for coming. Thank you.